Okay. How many of you watch the show Mythbusters? Yes. It's not on anymore, I know. Or have watched the show at another time. Mythbusters. Yeah, I, I haven't watched it that often, uh, but I watched it a couple times, and I'm always interested because typically what they deal with is stuff that most people believe that isn't true. Now, if you think about that, so it's possible for lots of people to believe something that isn't true. Uh, and, and so, let me give you a couple a analogies here. Uh, blood is blue. Blood is blue. People, people think that the veins, the blood in your veins is blue. I mean, it looks blue, doesn't it? Like I'm looking at veins here, they look blue. But, but if, you, if you ever, you know, hurt yourself or puncture yourself or even put something, what is it going to be? It's going to be red, right. So it just looks blue. Now, I know most of you don't believe that one, but let me give you another one. Uh, the Great Wall of China is the only man-made thing that you can see from space. How many of you believe that? Now, you're not going to do it because you're, you're thinking, hey, I'm going I'm to catch you, right? But there's a ton of you that believe that, right? Because I did too, right? It's not true. First of all, to even see the wall, you have to, fly, you have to be in space at very low altitude. Like when you're revolving around the moon, you're not going to see the Great Wall. And the fact is, that runways and major highways are easier to see than the Great Wall. You didn't know that, right? Aha! See? Mythbusters. Okay, this is another one. We only use 10% of our brains. <laughs> Actually, 10% of your brain is this gray matter, right? And 90% of your brain is the white matter. That's what they tell me. Anyway, and uh, so the, the idea has been that, oh, the gray matter is the real thinking part and the white matter is, is not, and so you only use 10% of your brains. But that's not true. Because when they do MRIs and they're looking at people who are thinking, they're actually using all over the place in their brain. And so it's actually not true. You can, you can just say a few words and there's tons of places in your brain that light. And so really the white matter is to feed the neurons in your brain and that's what white matter does and so on. So that idea of 10% of your brain is not true. So I know I didn't get you on the blue blood one because none of you thought you had blue blood. Uh, but uh, I think I got you on the other two. Um, so you can, a whole bunch of people can believe something that's wrong. And in Christianity, that is so apparent to us. Because when we look in the Bible, we realize that there are myths that everybody pretty well believes and they're not true. Uh, so I, what I want to do is, I want to give you a summary of the first six chapters of the book of Romans, sorry, uh, first six chapters of the book of Romans by taking on some of the myths that people believe. Okay? Myth number one. There are good and bad people from God's perspective. Myth number one. There are good and bad people. So, we would say good people go to heaven, or people would say good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell, right? Well, who are the bad people? Well, usually they're the really one, really bad. In other words, they're not like any of us, right? They would be wife abusers, drug dealers, terrorists, child abusers, serial killers, which I'm thinking there's probably none of you that are those right? I'm hoping, you know. So the idea is there's really bad people 
and then there's the majority good people. And, and that's how we kind of think. Now, from God's perspective, though, in the book of Romans, that is not true. Now, let me, let me describe what some of us would think as the bad people. So, in verse 28 of chapter 1 of Romans, if you want to follow along. Uh, okay, so verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a deprived, depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness and wickedness and greed and evil and full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice. They are gossips. Now, gossips, okay, that one is not so bad, right? Anyway, here we go. Uh, being, okay, I did that. Slanderers, haters of God, insolent, verse 30, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to your parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God or the commands of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give heartily, hearty approval to those who practice this. Okay. So that's, that's what we kind of would think are the bad people. And, and of course, the bad people are going to be condemned by God, right? Are there good people? Are there good people from God's perspective? Well, the very next verse, in chapter 2, uh, the very next verse is really instructive for us. Because it says, therefore, you are without excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. Now, how many of you actually pass judgment on the list of, that I just gave? I mean, would you probably think, oh, disgusting, those people, right? Terrible, those bad people, you know, because... And the list I gave you, you know, the wife abusers and drug dealers and serial killers and terrorists and child abusers. You want, you want to just almost, you, you almost want to do something to them, don't you? He says, therefore, you are without excuse. Now, who's he going to say is it without excuse? Every man of you, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. I want you to think about that. From God's perspective, if you've ever judged another person, I would think unrighteously, like because I mean it's okay to have judgment that's right and, and good, but I mean if you've ever judged another person, then God says you are without excuse. You say, well, how does that work? Well, Jesus said that if you ever look at a woman, or I guess a woman at a man, I can't really imagine that, but Anyway, a look at a woman with lust. You have committed adultery with her. That's what Jesus said. Now, when you think about that, that's, that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? If you've ever looked at a woman with lust, it's like you've committed adultery with her. If, now, this one's even better. If you've ever been angry at someone, it's like what? You've murdered them. See, God's standards and ours are completely different. We've got okay stuff, you know, like gossip. That would be kind of okay, wouldn't it? It's not as bad as beating someone or something like that. In other words, God's standards are very different than ours. We have to realize that. In, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, listen to what he says. This is, this is what God thinks of normal people who we would call good people. This is what he says. Verse 10. It is written, There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become useless. There is none who does good. And there is not even one. Now you say, Wow, God is so severe. Like, you know, I mean, what, what's wrong with God? Can he be a little bit understanding? I mean, but the fact is, 
That's really interesting that the creator is telling the createe, sorry, <laughs> is that a word? Mm, the created. Okay, the created is telling the creator what his standards should be. You know, think about that. That doesn't work in usual. I mean, if you create something, you get to design it, right? You get to figure out what's the responsibilities. We don't create, so that's a hard analogy to think through. But the fact is, God made us so he gets to do the standards. And what he said is, not one of us in our heart, in our life, in our practice has ever been righteous. Not one of us, the best person in the whole world, is not measured up to what God demands of a human being. Now, if it just stayed that way, that would be really severe. Look at verse 19. He says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Now, the law is like the Ten Commandments. It's like the other laws that God gave. It's, it's the standards that God gave. And this is what he says. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Now, what's the purpose of the law? What's God's purpose? That you and I should figure out how to follow it? Or, listen to what he says, that every mouth may be closed and that all the world may become accountable to God because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. What is he saying? He's basically saying there's no such thing as a good person. And in a way, there's no such thing as a bad person because in our idea of a bad person, they're really bad and they're not like us. He's basically saying we're all on the same level. Every human being, every single one of us hasn't made it. Every single one of us, every human being has not reached the target that God wanted. Now, so everyone is in the same boat, and the boat's sinking, honestly. Uh, in chapter, well, let me deal with the fact. There's an, another corollary of this myth, and that is that I must be good enough because I'm a pretty good person. Have you ever heard that? I must be good enough. I'm a pretty good person. I, I don't, you know, hurt people. I try to do good things. You know, I, you know, I give, you know, when the, there's a hurricane and I, you know, different things like that. Like, I, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a good citizen. I vote, you know. I help people. I shovel my neighbor's walk and so on. And the idea is that the, somehow a human being can be good enough for God to accept them completely. And the Bible doesn't say that. Verse chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. There's a sense where this myth that you can be good enough, that there are good and bad people, and I look at the bad people and think, oh boy, I'm not like that, so I must be good that you can somehow compare yourself to those really bad people and you can be okay. Now, why is this important? Because this is widespread belief in our society. Would you agree with that? This is what most people believe. And they're wrong. They're as wrong as, you know, the Wall of China thing, you know, the Blue Blood thing or... I guess nobody believes that anyway, but they're, they're all wrong. So how are they going to know the truth? Who's going to tell them? I mean, if you and I don't tell them, who's going to tell them? What would change the myth that there are good and bad people in the world and that 
you can be good enough to get into heaven. The only thing that's going to change it is you and I speaking up and telling them it's not true. Now, honestly, they may not believe you, but they're sure not going to change their mind if nobody ever talks to them. What does it mean about you and I? Number one, if every human being needs a Savior because every human being has missed the target, missed the mark, has sinned, there's not much difference between us and them, is there? Except for Jesus. So, because you and I are Christians, does that make us better than them? Not really. If we've all sinned, we're all in the same boat, then the only thing that would change that is accepting Jesus Christ into your life as your Savior and your Lord. And somehow we have to share it with them. We're no better than them, but there are no good people and bad people in our world. I, I would like to say we're all bad. We've all missed the mark. From God's perspective, we've all missed the mark. And the only difference is if you have Jesus, you have life and salvation. If you don't have Jesus, you don't. You say, well, I don't like this kind of God. But think about it. He, he allows every single person to believe if they want to. In fact, that's the next thing we're going to talk about. The next myth is that you must earn your way to heaven. Lots of people believe that. The corollary of this one is you can never know if you're going to heaven. Because you never know if you've earned enough. And so what you do is you strive to earn, to be good, to do good things all your life, hoping that you will accumulate enough good stuff so that God will let you into heaven. Uh, in Romans chapter 4, if you were to read the whole chapter, it's all about Abraham. And it will say over and over and over again, it'll say, uh, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So, what is, it, what is he saying? He's going to say that three or four times in that one chapter. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He's saying, if you trust in God, then God... The word reckon is actually an accounting term. It's like God puts a credit in your account. And the credit in your account is that you are right with Him. So it's not what we do. It's not what we earn. It's not how much we accumulate in good works and good deeds. It's actually a credit that God gives for your account you being righteous, in fact, the word righteous means, it's also the word justification in, in, the, in Greek. Righteousness and justification is the same root words. But in English, we don't have that. We, we have to use two different. We use the Greek one for, for one, one word, and we use the Latin one for the other. And so, but in, in Greek, when this was written down, it means that you are righteous, and God declares you justified. And justified means He'll treat you just as if you've never sinned. Now, have we sinned? Of course. I mean, we realized that before. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God has a provision. And the provision comes through faith. Not through good works. Even though most people think it does. Would you agree with that? I mean, when you tell people, Hey, no, it's you trust in God, and when you trust in God, He credits to your life a right standing with Him. And so it's not what you do, it's whether you trust or not, whether you believe or not. You study the Gospels over and over and over again. Jesus meets people, and He asks them, do you believe in me? And when they believe, there's a miracle that happens but really, the biggest miracle that happens is salvation in a person. It comes through trusting in Jesus, even though most people don't know that. Um, in chapter 5, verse 1, 
therefore have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. So what is he saying? He's saying the way that you and I stand in grace, we do that, that introduction to God and the peace of God. We get peace with God by trusting in Him, simply. So it's not by earning our way to heaven. It's, it's not by doing all the right things and all the, wor- all the works. And you and I can know whether we have eternal life or not because it's about receiving a gift. It's about receiving a gift. In chapter 5, verse 15, but the free gift is not like the transgression. I want you to notice how often the word gift and grace are in the next few verses. But the free gift is not like the transgression, for the transgression, or by the transgression of one, too many died. Much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. What is he saying? He's saying that when Adam sinned, from that point on, every single human being sinned. When Jesus came, Jesus lived a perfect life, died for our sins, and then offers us a free gift that we receive by trusting, by faith. So it's not what you do. It's not how good you are. It's not how many good works you do or how often you shovel someone's sidewalk or be nice or give to a charity or anything like that. It it is whether you trust in Jesus Christ or not. That's the only thing it is. And then chapter 6, verse 23. This really makes it clear. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the wages of sin is death. So what do we get for sinning? We get death, spiritual death. What do we get uh, from God? The free gift is eternal life. So if God gives you eternal life, what does that mean? Carl? Carl? I'm going to pretend here. I'm God. That takes a lot of pretending. I know. (laughs) And I have a gift to give you. And that gift is eternal life. Okay? Okay. So I've got the gift right here. You've got to decide whether you want it or not. Do you want it? Okay. Okay, you say that you want it. So I'm going to give you this free gift. There it is. You got it. Okay, so what did you just get? Eternal life. So what does that mean? That, does that mean in a hundred years, you're gonna, you're, that'll be it? No, a thousand years. A little longer. So eternity is eternity, right? What's that saying there? That little guy, the, I, whatever, sorry. I forget. Uh, beyond eternity, to eternity and beyond? Oh, it's infinity and beyond, Okay. Okay, that's what it was. Yes. I'm sorry. I screwed it all up. Uh, So, if God gives you the gift of eternity, eternal life, infinity, same thing, right? Infinite night life. Could you could you ever could you ever take it away? Like you could never get away, right? You could never not have it. Because it's eternal. So either you have eternal life or you don't. It has to be a gift, if you think about it. When God gives it to you, once you've got it, you will live forever. 
And the Bible says this is written that you may know that you have eternal life. Those of you who believed on Jesus Christ. See, people don't know this. People don't know. They, they're absolutely convinced they have to work their way to heaven. They've got to clean up their own act. When God says, I'll take you just the way you are, I give you the gift of eternal life, so that's the way it works. It's exactly what he says here. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The last myth. And then I'll quit. Uh, God is a reluctant, punishing, vengeful God. Uh, chapter 5, verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So firstly, he says, we're helpless. Then we're ungodly. He says, for one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare to even die. He's saying, okay, you're helpless, you're ungodly, Jesus dies for you anyway. It makes sense that somebody would die for a good person. But, but you and me aren't the good persons. But verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us in while that we were yet sinners. So helpless, ungodly sinners. Uh, Christ died for us. Much more, verse 9, then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more will be reconciled through his life. Uh, we shall be saved by his life. What, so he called us helpless, ungodly, sinners, and enemies. Now, does that sound like a reluctant God, a vengeful God, a punishing God? It's exactly the opposite. I mean, we are in a pickle. We're in, we're in trouble. So what does God do? He does everything to get us back. Even though we're ungodly, even though we're enemies, even though we're helpless, even though we're sinners, it doesn't matter to God. He's going for it, for the cross. He's going to die for us. In fact, he'll die for even the people that never accept him. And I believe that because the Bible says that. So what does that mean? Now I want to put this all together in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. This is what Paul says. Well, verse 15. Well, verse 14, sorry. Well, let's go back to verse 1. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Verse 14, I am under obligation to both the Greeks and to the barbarians, to both the wise and to the foolish. Why is he under obligation? Because they don't know what's going on. Because they believe these myths that are untrue. Because they have no idea what is the reality of salvation, the reality of how to get a relationship with God, the reality of how you get eternal life, the reality of how you go to heaven. They have no idea. So Paul says, I'm, oblig I'm under obligation. I'm going to tell them. He says, for my part, I am eager to share or to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew, by the way, that would be to the good person, because they lived a pretty good life, Jews. And to the Gentile or the Greek. And that was very licentious. In those days, like if you were a Greek and you lived according to the mores or the morals of the Greek or Roman culture, my goodness, everything was open. Maybe a lot like today. And so what is he saying? He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God of salvation to everyone who believes. To the good people who aren't really good, and to the bad people, who really aren't very bad because we're all in the same boat. We are uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, why do I read that to you? Because I think some of us might be ashamed, or at least intimidated, because we see what everybody believes, and we see how 
counterculture we are and how we counter those myths that many people believe. But the fact is, you and I are indebted to the people who told us the truth, which makes sense that we would be indebted to the people that don't know, that believe these untrue myths that are not true. And so, could, would we be eager to preach the gospel to everyone? Because it's the power of God for everyone who believes. I don't care how far gone someone is. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone that believes. It is the only hope for every human being. Because every single one of us is in the same boat and it's sinking. I want you to just bow your head for a moment. I want you to think about some of your friends, some of your acquaintances, some of the workers, your colleagues, people that are around you, that surround you in your everyday life. How many of them believe these myths that aren't true? What is the hope for them to ever believe the right thing? Are you their hope? God working in their life through you. Lord Jesus, we want to be like Paul, where we feel indebted to share the truths, even if in our society those truths are not believed and people believe myths that are wrong. That we be eager to preach the gospel, the good news. The good news that even though every single human being, in a sense, is guilty and condemned, all they need to do is receive the gift that you've already prepared by faith, by, by simply trusting. When we simply trust, you can change our whole life. You give us eternity. You give us eternal life. You change the inside. You make us into a new creation, a new person. That's our only hope. That's the only difference between us and them. But somebody told us. Somebody showed us the truth. Help us to show them. In Jesus' name, amen.